Hey everybody, Steve Fredland here from the Rec Poker Podcast. Welcome to another episode. Special thanks to Running Aces for being our official sponsor. Uh, this episode's a little bit different. Uh, we've been doing a rotating expert thing where we talk about specific hands with those rotating experts. And this week we had to defer our interview. Uh, so what I did instead is I'm putting together um, a section of our weekly chats, our community groups that we do on Monday nights from 8 to 9.30 p.m. Uh, every Monday night we have a video call and it's free of charge. You do need to register, but it's free. And it's just an opportunity to get together and talk with other people about hands, about situations, about concepts, whatever it might be. Uh, it's pretty unstructured. And uh, these, these chats are just fantastic. I've thoroughly enjoyed them and thoroughly enjoyed the people. And so I thought, uh, well, since we don't have an interview this week, why don't I take a, a section of that and make that into a podcast? So that's what we've done here. So that's what's going to be coming up here uh, after I make some of these uh, initial announcements, uh, which are, first of all, uh, Crazy Like a Fox, the, the training videos, the training interactive uh, online sessions are coming up. March 21st is the first one. Uh, this is just going to be fantastic. It's an opportunity to get about 15 hours of training and interactive learning and Q&A with one of the best players in the world. Uh, he has a World Series of Poker bracelet, Chris Fox Wallace. And so he's going to be doing some training every Thursday night, followed by maybe an hour of Q&A. Uh, there'll be a private discussion board for people that are part of this thing. And it retails for 300 bucks. But if you are part of Rec Poker Nation, you can use the code Fox Rec Poker, F O X R E C P O K E R, when you register. And that will get it to you for half off. So for 150 bucks, uh, you get 15 hours of training and interactive discussion. Uh, you'll get access to the discussion boards. You get access to homework. You get access to each video for a week after it airs. Uh, so a lot of really good value, I think, there uh, that you could take advantage of. I also want to mention Mike Juszczyk, uh, who is a, a recreational poker player in Minnesota, runs an app for your phone called Frugal, F-R-O-O-G-L-E. And that will get you discounts at liquor stores, restaurants, even at Running Aces. Uh, and so you just walk into the store. If you have the app on your phone, it'll pop up with what coupon you can use. And you can take advantage of that. So Mike's a good guy. So I just told him, hey, you know what? Why don't I give you a shout out uh, on the podcast uh, for Frugal, F-R-O-O-G-L-E. So check that out as well. Uh, just also with the crazy like a fox thing, uh, I've, I've mentioned we're doing giveaways. So if you finish in the top four of Running Aces Player of the Week for any given week, the top player gets the course for free. The other three get the course for 50 bucks. So congratulations to Jesse Johnson for winning that this last week. And John Sandberg, Andrew Francis, and Mark Rhodes for finishing second through fourth and having an option to get the, get the uh, course for just 50 bucks. So check that out, guys. And we got one more week left uh, to try to win the Player of the Week. And last week was a short week uh, for Player of the Week because they had the Pot of Gold tournament, which I had an opportunity to play quite a bit of. Uh, there were six flights for day one. I played four of them and I actually got through three times, which means two of them uh, I got buybacks for a total of 2400 bucks. And the other bag I brought into Sunday, there was 102 people that advanced out of 750 or so. 102 advanced to Sunday. The top 72 got paid. And I ended up busting in 60 seconds. So I did get the money. got another 550 bucks or so. Uh, and then just uh, just lost in a couple of spots uh, on the button with pocket nines, shoved into pocket kings with about 20 bigs. Uh, that lost half my stack. And then I lost the rest uh, when I shoved ace queen and got called by pocket deuces. Uh, and that held up for Tony Sanchez. So um, I'm fine with all those decisions. Felt like I played really well. And it was overall a great result uh, financially for me uh, for that tournament. Uh, but just a great week. Back to regular stuff now. Uh, so with all of those introductory comments, let's break into this uh, this this weekly chat, uh, a section of the weekly chat from this past Monday. And again, if you want to be part of this thing, there's no cost. You just have to register. Go to recpokertraining.com. Uh, look for community groups or weekly chats. It's the same thing, Mondays, 8 to 9.30 p.m. Central Time. I would love to have you join us for that. Okay, let's let's uh, listen in. Yeah, no, so John sent me, I thought, what was a really interesting hand, and uh, we chatted a little bit about it, and I thought it'd be great for us, the group, to discuss. And so, uh, John, are you willing to kind of lead us through that, just kind of stop whenever you want and get input? Yeah, yeah, that's fine. All right, I will share the screen here so people can see it as you're chatting. For those of you who are listening on the podcast, uh, you can't see this, but we'll do our best to, to describe it. Uh, so I'll, I'll turn it over. It's all yours, John. 
Okay. So um, I play in a home league on uh, Wednesday nights, and uh, we were in the final week of a 10-week season. Um, and so I don't know how many of you guys play home leagues or anything, but you play for points each week, and then after 10 weeks, uh, they announce the top eight are automatically in the final table, and then we have a wild card weekend uh, or a wild card tournament that puts the ninth person in in the in the final table. So going into this uh, into that into that evening last Wednesday, I was securely in the top eight, so I didn't have to worry about uh, how that play went. And so in my mind, I was planning on playing uh, um, tight aggressive the whole night. However, with this hand, I will say I didn't actually follow through very well on that, <laughs> on that thought process. So um, this is very early in the tournament. Uh, the chip stacks are listed there. I have 8,800. 8, Gary has 10-4, uh, and Doug has 10-2. And Gary's the dealer, and Doug is in the big blind, and I'm in the cutoff position. So I look down, I have pocket jacks. I raised to 300, and uh, the button calls. The small blind folds, and the big blind re-raises to 60. 650 um, and then I, I call and the button also calls. So that puts the pot at about 2000. Okay, uh, so the blinds are 50, 100. So you're all, you're, it's pretty deep. You got 88 bigs, they each got 100 bigs. Okay, raise to three, re-raise to six and a half and two calls. Okay. So the flop comes with jack of hearts, 10 of hearts and nine of clubs. Wait a minute, so before, before we go there, did you ever consider Three betting with your pocket jack, or four betting with your po pocket jacks? I did not at the time, but after doing my uh, review of this, <laughs> uh, I certainly gave that a lot of thought and probably thought that would have been the best play at that point was to re-raise at that point. The, the question, I guess the question is, um, the big blind three bet you, um, how do you think his range looked at that time when he three bet you, what, what were your thoughts on his range at that time? Yeah. So Doug is a, a pretty tight player. Um, and he's probably, he's, he's probably the easiest one to read at that point in this league. And for that reason, I put him on exactly what he had, which was ACE King, maybe ACE Queen, but he ended up with ACE King. Okay. So there's, there's kind of a fear there of, of four betting him just because if he does have a big hand, which is, the most likely scenario you end up getting it all in with pocket jacks or something. Yeah. Okay. So your thought was, well, you could uh, set mine with your jacks or hope that an ace king or queen doesn't flop. Correct. All right. So the flop comes with jack of hearts, 10 of hearts, nine of clubs. Um, so I, I hit my, uh, my jack and then there is the straight draw, there is the flush draw. So I'm a little concerned about those at that point. So I lead out with 1,200 uh, into a pot of 2050. How can you lead out? Does the big one check first? Uh, he probably did, yes. I'm sorry, but Good he point. probably did. You were just so excited you just led without him. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah we you just led out of turn. <laughs> Okay, so, so check to you. You go ahead and bet about 60% uh, of the pot. Yep. And both, both, uh, both gentlemen then call that, call that bet. So now the pot goes to 5650. 50. So how did you, if you can recall, how are you feeling at this point? So you, obviously you flopped top set on a pretty much good news, bad news sort of flop. Uh, are you feeling pretty comfortable? Or are you feeling like, Man, I, I might want to you know slow down here a little bit. Kind of how do you how do you feel when you get called by two two of those folks? Well, again, I thought with with uh, the big blind, I figured he had ace king is what I put him on. So I wasn't as concerned with that at this point, um, but I wasn't as confident with the dealer because um, <clears throat> I play him on a regular basis in a couple of different leagues, and he he can be tricky to try to put on a range. And so I wasn't sure exactly where he was, and that's what made me more nervous. So, so King Queen is very much in his range. Sure. Yeah. Well, seven eight. Could be, but um, yeah, I mean, at, at that point, I wasn't as concerned about seven eight. Um, I was more worried about King Queen or even just uh, a Queen with something else at that point. 
The Queen of Hearts, maybe with maybe. Do how about Queen Eight? Was Queen Eight there? I, you know, later in the later in the in the hand, I I rule out the eight altogether. I was I was thinking more uh, where he might have Queen Ten or uh, okay. Ace Queen, something along that lines. But um, with him, like I said, it's a little harder to to put him on a range uh, okay. at that point. All right. Okay, so after the uh, turn comes the three of diamonds. And uh, so the big blind checks, uh, and then I bet 2,000 out uh, into the pot of 5650. And then the button calls and the big blind calls. Wow. <laughs> who said wow, was that Rob or who said wow? Yeah, I did. I mean, going, wow, what, you know, what are they calling with? It's like, wow. It, yeah, it's yeah, just weird. That's a big, big bet. And then both people call. That's kind of strange. He said it's a big, it's about a third of the pot. Uh, isn't it 2,000? Yeah, into 5,600 or so. Was the yeah. ace king the heart? Well, Wait, let's get uh, the bet sizing. So, let's get the bet sizing clear. So, so John. Sorry, I was thinking the flop bet. Sorry. Okay, yeah, yeah. So the bet uh, he has here after the, after the flop, the pot built to 5,600. Uh, he bet 2,000. So about. Oh. A little over third. Yeah. It, it's so interesting too. It's hard for me. This is a kind of a difficult hand ranging one because if I have, I know you already kind of disclosed what they have, but if they have two pair, you'd think that they would be raising to, you know, raising to try to protect that. It's such a wet board. So to okay. me, this just feels like two draws that nobody wants to overplay. Cause most people, if they have, you know, at least two hearts here are going to get a little bit janky on the flop and kind of rip it in or, you know, make a big raise. So it's, it's, yeah, this is kind of a weird one for me where they just call two people, just call flop and turn. I kind of on. felt like, I kind of felt like the 2000 bet now looking back at it, what well, probably wasn't enough. I probably should have went to like 28 or even 3000 at that point to at least get rid of one of the two. Yeah, we've had so many great discussions on bet sizing too. I actually like this size bet, but I think I, I might be in the minority. Um, yeah, it depends on what you're trying to do. If you're trying to chase people out, that's one thing. If, or are you trying to get them to have a bad, um, I guess, bad odds to call with their draws? There's two things you're doing there. You don't want to chase them out because – on the flop and a turn, you're going to get people to call with their draws. On the river, you can't because they've either hit their draws or not. So the only time you're going to get value is on these two streets. So even if you're, I mean, if you're facing two draws, your equity goes down a little bit, but you're not going to get any value on the river. So. Well, typically when a board is this wet, I tend to bet bigger or I don't bet at all. I, I'm either in let's protect it or give up. So I, in this, with this particular flop texture, I think the, I tend to agree that the 2000 was a little too small. So John, would you have bet flop bigger too, or just uh, do you like the flop bet size or, I mean, the flop bet size was about 60%. And then the, uh, the turn bet size was, you know, 30 to 40%. Yeah, I I was fine with the twelve hundred, but I think I should have went higher on the on the on the turn bet. Yeah, I I may have been inclined to actually, I mean, you're you're set up right now with almost a pot size bet. Yeah, with your whole pot, yeah, stack. Um, so you kind of have two choices. You can either try to get the maximum value out of it, which would lead to about a betting about half your stack. Um, but then you're, you almost are forced to call no matter what comes on the river. Um, just in case they were going for the opposite draw. And then, uh, or you could shove it right there. It's not that big of an oversized pot, but then you're probably not going to get much value. You're just going to, and there is a potential that someone has king, queen, and you're already beat but you're not drawing dead. Yeah, somebody's slow playing you. What pocket pairs could they have? 
what pocket pairs could they be calling with here? Obviously, tens or nines. You'd probably see uh, a raise by now. Um, I mean, that's it, right? I mean, tens, nines, or eights, or eights, or what queens. Do you, do you think they they wouldn't? Well, I guess he. I guess we just called, right? They we were three bet by queens, out of the big blind, right? We could have been three bet by queens. Sure. That's true. So aces, kings, or queens, and I was thinking that we were the final aggressor. No. Nope. No, nope. yeah, it could be. Queens could be there. Eights yeah. could definitely be there. I think all of the smaller pairs are going to fold. Uh, maybe they might float the flop, but they're going to fold the turn. Yeah, I think three-handed, they they for sure fold the turn. Okay. Anything else? Well, if, if you bet more than 2,000, to me, it's almost like, God, you almost, almost could shove there instead. And 2,000, I could get away from if a heart came. But I don't know. I Well, if I would have bet 3,000, let's say, I'd still have 6,000 left behind. So it's only a third of my stack at that point. So I wouldn't necessarily have to shove at that point. It wouldn't be ideal, but I'd still have plenty of chips left over. Yeah, but then you look at how many chips you have versus the pot when you get to the river. And you don't even have a half pot size bet then assuming that it one of them calls yeah so you want to you want to size your bet so that when you get to the river you have a a scary bet you know as it is you you've got less than a pot size left that you all have less than a pot size left when you get to the river so that, and so there's two ways of looking at it i mean is the bet too small on the turn or is if you bet any bigger, like um, I think Doug said, don't you just well, go, all you in? go all in? Might... There's 12,000 in the pot. Someone might call you with that to put in like 6,000 more to win 12. I don't know. I'd be hesitant to put just like 40% of my chips in or whatever, or, even like the 30%, it's like, I might as well just go all in here and mm -hmm. take my chances with it. Yeah, again, because you look at it, if they call your bet, your, you know, your turn bet, it's only 2,000. They call that bet, and you got the situation we have right here where we have less than a pot size bet left. Um, of course, so do they. But it just seems to me that, you know, you could – if they're going to call 2,000, they're probably going to call all in. Or you could just check the turn, hoping to get your um, the, the rest of the chips in on the river because you'd have a, mm -hmm. you know, you'd have over a pot size bet then and you could really put some pressure on them. I don't know. All right. So moving on, then the uh, river comes the seven of diamonds. Big blind checks, I check, and the button shoves for the remaining 65.50. And he does have me covered. I noticed there's an error in, the, in my totals after the turn. I really have 61.50, not 69.50. Well, it shows 49.50 in your stack. I was wondering about that because early on, you were the you had less chips than they did. Yeah. Yeah. By, they have me covered. By I, about twenty thousand. I thought you had like eighty eight. You had eighty eight big blinds and they each had over a hundred. Yes. So you're somewhere along the line you're your re, what's remaining in your stack is wrong. Yes, it is. I apologize for that, but it is wrong. So that that even makes that bet on the turn, you know, a little bit. You know, because you didn't have sixty nine fifty, you probably had more like forty nine fifty, right? Remaining. No, I think I had sixty one fifty. After your uh, turn bet, I would add eighty one fifty after the flop, and then if you take take two thousand away, I'd have sixty one fifty after the turn. Right, and then after your bet on the turn, you would have forty one fifty. Well, I think no, you, you put in is after the two thousand dollar bet. Yeah, you put in six fifty plus twelve hundred plus two thousand. 
So 3850. So it should leave you around 5,000 or so if that 8,800 was correct. All right. So that leaves you with a half pot, half pot bet. And that's where Doug was saying, you know, maybe on the turn is where you should have gotten frisky and got it all in. Okay. Well, I, yeah, I think for me, it, it comes down to, I mean, it's all about variance and how much variance you want to play. I mean, obviously, if you have the best hand, it's nice to get chips in the middle, but it increases variance. I mean, if they have a straight draw and a flush draw, or if they have two pair in a set, and if you don't think they're going to fold anyway, then your shove on the turn is just saying, let's just play for it all and uh, see what happens. If you, you know, you bet small like this, it, I think the idea would be it gives you a chance to get away if you feel like you're beat on the river. Now, some people are never going to fold a set on the river anyway. So I think if your tent is never to fold on the river anyway, then I like the bigger bigger uh, shove on the turn or bigger bet at least. Um, but if you're willing to say, you know what, I'm, I'm going to try to get value while I think I'm ahead here, but I'm willing to fold the river. I guess I personally don't mind this, this sort of play. Um, as long as you just sort of have the dis discipline to get away if, you know, if an ace, a king or a queen or something, some really scary card comes. Yeah, I mean, how often are we ahead on the turn here? When it's jack, 10, 9, 3, two hearts. Like, I, I feel like we're ahead so often here, right? Yeah, almost always. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and we bet huge on the flop and got two calls. We bet, what is it, 60-ish percent or something like that? Yep. Flop, got two calls. Um, we have just over a pot size bet. Like, I feel like just jamming the turn here is best just because we're ahead. Our opponents have shown willingness to call. Um, if they fold, great. We just take down the hand, but like we're so often ahead. If we can get in the money, great here. Like I would just go for it. That's yeah. I mean, I, yeah. I mean, cause I, I tend to think, you know, King queen, even on the flop is probably going to shove over our raise just because of the two hearts out there. Um, you think they so on the flop? I, I think they might. I mean, we both, when, uh, you know, three handed, we bet 1200 and they both just flat. Mm -hmm. I don't know. I guess I don't know these players at all, obviously. Yeah. But if, if I have King Queen there, especially if I don't have two hearts, it'd be tempting to put in a raise there just because, you know, there's, there's a lot of heart draws out there three handed or, you know, King or a Queen could be a really bad card for us too. Mm -hmm. No, I, I think it's definitely possible. I so think it, it really depends on the player, like you're saying. It does. I mean, so, so if that, my point being is, you know, so if, if we can rule King Queen out, which obviously we can't in all cases, but if we rule that out, then we are, we have the absolute nuts. Well, I guess unless I think seven eights out there. I just don't think that's mm -hmm. out there either. Cause that would have, that would have shoved too. But, you know, so we have the absolute stone cold nuts on the turn. Then if we take King Queen out of the equation. Yeah. I mean, there's the a lot question, of plus draws out there. And yeah. And, yeah. and that's the thing. Is, do we think, turn if we shove. Yeah. I mean, that's what I'm, that's what I'm, yeah. Do we think that they'll fold? Do we think ace king or ace queen king, you know, with, with two hearts are they ever going to fold? Do we think Jack 10 is ever going to fold? Um, and yeah, so we don't, we don't well, want yeah, it to fold. Yeah. Do you care? You're at that well, point in time, you're, they have only got nine outs on one, dra one street. Yeah. Which means they're about 20% to draw your equity. You're getting, you know, about, four to one on your money if they both call. Yep. So hell yeah, no, I, I don't disagree from an EV perspective. I don't disagree at all. You're saying uh, just, but, just but really from a, yeah, from a tournament, a perspective, bet? From a tournament perspective, you know, if they're never going to fold, yeah, we want to maximize chips, but if we put in a, a non shove bet um, and could, because they're going to call either way, uh, we still get some value there and we can still get away and survive the tournament if the ace of hearts comes on the river or something like that. If we yeah. think, we, if we think we'd ever fold. I understand that yeah. there is, there is something to be said for uh, maintaining your tournament life, but in this spot, the equity that you're getting to me is worth the risk. So Fair for enough. me, I'm saying, uh, yeah, normally you want to be a little more conservative in tournaments, care about your tournament life. But in this case, you're getting such good price. Um, and you're also, by doing this, you're, you're protecting the equity you already have in the pot and you're improving your equity on the final uh, river as well. Also remember that they won't call on the river if they don't hit their draw. Yeah. So you get those chips. That, right. that, that's what I'm advocating a shove on the turn for is yeah. we, we let them realize their equity. Like if they've got a stray eight in their hand, a stray queen or two hearts, 
there's so many cards out there that immediately decide how they're going to play the river. If we can take away that option from them by just jamming on the turn, like I feel like we are making a more profitable decision. I guess, uh, yeah, I, I don't disagree with any of that stuff. It's all good stuff. I think what, I mean, if we, if we shove turn, what hands end up folding that we are really disappointed fold that would have called this one third to one fourth, you know, size, uh, pot size bet. Cause that's part of it too, is we're, we're shoving out, we're potentially, uh, you know, losing some equity there by forcing hands to fold that otherwise wouldn't have, you know, things like ace jack or something. I think a straight eight and a straight queen would fold to the turn where we technically don't want them to. But I think we've been keeping a lot of flush draws, um, even a, a queen with a little bit better equity, a queen jack might. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know. I, I haven't thought through, like, in terms of the whole range sizing thing. Right. So it's the trade off. So we get those hands to fold that we have crushed, but then on the other hand, they can't realize their equity either because they can't outdraw us if they fold. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So it sounds like the consensus is much more of a, uh, of a turn shove here. Well, I just think the stack with the stack sizes, I think that it, it really makes sense. Now, one thing to be able to put any pressure on anybody on the river. And if they don't, if they don't hit, they're not going to call a bet on the river. So well, the only time you're going to be able to re realize as much value as you can is on the turn. Well, not. I mean, if they, if the jack ten or the pocket tens or the pocket nines, I think you're going to get still value from that on the river. That's a very small, small portion of their range. But we don't have their range much wider than that, do we? What well, do you think is still in there? Do you think like king jack is still in there, maybe, or what do you think is still in there that? Wouldn't King X of Hearts or or maybe a Queen X of Hearts keep going? And... Yeah, Ace X of Hearts yeah. is definitely in their range. In the in the uh, buttons range anyway. Because the big yeah, blind that's... is the one that three bet us, right? So the button is wide open. I mean he could have any two cards. See that that's a hard I mean I, I don't I don't disagree. It could be in there. It's hard for me because I do believe that like an ace king of hearts, ace queen of hearts. Uh, you know, at some point, either on the flop or the turn, is going to put some pressure on themselves. Maybe, maybe they're just really passive. But you know, they got they have two overs, a gut shot, and the nut flush draw. I just feel like at some point, in a three-handed pot, they're going to ratchet it up. But maybe I'm wrong. I mean, I could be completely wrong. But is that what you would do? I have five ace king hearts or ace, <laughs> or ace right. king ace king or ace queen hearts. Yeah, yeah, and I know that's not what you're saying. That you know we assume that people do what we're gonna do. <laughs> exactly. Oh my god, if I have ace king hearts, ace queen hearts, and this guy leads into me on the flop, yeah, let's go. Oh, you're going crazy. Let Let's dance. You got I, I the nuts. Mind, well, because I don't know, because I don't mind folds there. It just applies max pressure. No. You know, by the time you get to the turn in the river, you just uh, like you guys are saying, you just don't have the same fold, fold equity that you do on the flop. So, on that flop, I have ace high. So I, I don't mind folds, but man, if I get called, I've got you know, 9, 10, 11, 12 outs to the nuts. Yep, yep. So that's, yeah, but that's, again, maybe assuming that others are going to play like you play. So that's why I take, I guess I take those hands out of the range there. I can see more like an ace eight of hearts kind of thing. If you had um, pocket queens in this situation, would you jam on, or raise on the flop? If, in John, okay. in, so, in John um, Binsky's spot? No, I'm thinking the big blind, the guy that raised it. So we talked earlier, we oh, said big yeah. blind's a pretty tight guy. You can probably put him on some premium hands. Um, queens, kings, aces, very much in his range. Um, do you think he re-raises those, or can we like limit him down outside of those hands? It's so, I mean, it's so hard, because I guess on the flop, we, we you know, the, the big blind actually checked to us. Mm -hmm. So would it would pocket queens check there? Um, you're asking what I would do with pocket queens out of the big blind. I, I'm just like raising yeah. the discussion. Yeah, um, I'm just going back to the very first part of the discussion. He said, you know, I've got a pretty good read. I know what this guy's doing. He's probably pretty tight. Yeah. Um, so we can probably limit his hand pretty substantially and give him just like the premiums. Okay. And. Um, if he sees this flop with queens, kings, aces, and just calls on the flop, like I think we can definitely get him to call a jam on the turn too. Hmm. 
That's and a good question. That's it's a another point to like, hey, does he get a scare card on the river where he thinks he was good? Not only like is it scary enough for us, but also for our opponents. Again, I don't know how he plays. I don't know if he would check and then just call after some after the button called in front of him on the flop too. So could be very player dependent. Yeah, John Vensky, what do you think he does with Queens there? Like let's say that big blind, you know, he he bet with Queens and you uh and you just called their pre flop and then the flop comes Jack ten nine. How do you see him playing pocket queens, that opponent? Well, well the the odd thing with that is you know, he re-raised before the flop, but then he didn't bet out after the flop or after the turn or even on the river. So I wasn't worried about that. I, I felt pretty good that he didn't have anything and I was going to, he would eventually fold off or even if he didn't, he would lose his stack. If he had pocket Queens, I think he, he doesn't check in those positions. He bets out those positions. So um, that's when I got down to the river, I was not worried about him at all. I was only worried about the dealer. Okay. I think that's a safe assumption too, just based off of all the actions that the big blind took. Um, it seems so much like just ace king, ace queen. Mm -hmm. um, probably not even like ace jack. I, th I think he has a really narrow range based off of the description John gave and the actions that we've heard so far. The button, on the other hand, I, I don't know what his range is like pre-flop, but um, definitely more intrigued by him because he's calling before the big blind's calling on each street that we are betting out. Right. It, it feels like, you know, it feels like he's slow playing king, queen, or he's got pocket eights, pocket nines, pocket tens. Um, maybe a big flush draw. You know, an ace high flush draw. Mm -hmm. That's kind of what it feels like to me for the button. Yeah, and then obviously like the two pairs and the one pair with a gut shot at, or an open ended too. So like Queen Jack. Yeah. Um, right, right. Maybe eight nine, uh Jack ten, ten nine, all those types of hands, as well yeah. as yeah, all the big ace of hearts, other stuff. Right. Yeah, since he, he he just called pre flop, right? He just uh he flatted after John raised. Mm -hmm. So yeah, he could have any of the ace X hearts. Um and then like you say, all those two pair hands, those uh you know, medium size you can't put them on queens. You can't put the button on queens. He would probably would raise pre flop three bet pre flop with that. But you can put them on a queen jack. You can put them on pocket eights. And then all those hands that you mentioned, uh, Taylor. Yep. Yeah. Would, so John, what was kind of your uh, your final assessment, John Vensky? What was, where'd you come well, out on this thing? So the unfortunate thing is um, the, the button shoves all in and I go into the tank for a few minutes to think about it. Um, and I end up deciding that he has King Queen. And so therefore I fold um, and he actually had Jack 10. So he had two pair and mm -hmm. shoved with it. And so I should have called. And again, my, my thought process going into the tournament was that I wanted to be tight aggressive and this would have been the perfect, perfect time to shove on the turn. Like you guys discussed, or at least to call the river Um and I didn't do either. So I lost the big pot and uh, ended up being knocked out of the tournament shortly after this. Does does he call you all in if you uh, with Jack 10, do you think? Um, I did talk to him the next day about this just to kind of re as I was kind of putting together the recap, I wanted to just talk about it. And he definitely said he would have called if I would have shoved all in because he didn't think I had pocket jacks. He thought I was um, – you know, on a draw up, up to that point, and it would have been fine calling with two pair. Interesting. I mean, if you think about it, Jack 10 is not that much different than a set of uh, Jacks there. It's almost mm -hmm. the same hand as yep. far as Bob's concerned. 
Mm -hmm. And if someone else would have shoved earlier in it, you would have been awfully tempted to call as well. Obviously, you got down to the river and you didn't. And part of that is because at that point, you are you know it's binary. You're, you either have it and you've won or you've lost. There's no cards that can come to help you. And yeah, I'm a little... Go ahead, Rob. That's why you bet on the turn. That's why you bet bigger on the turn to get that to get that value. <laughs> no, no, it's why you check the check the river to get value. <laughs> that's, so, that's my I'm I'm checking for value on the river. Are you calling? Yeah. Yeah, I think I <laughs> not I mean that doesn't mean John should have. I mean, I don't know. I didn't think it through as you know as much as John had thought it through, but I, I think I think once I check the river, I'm I'm just underrepresenting my hand so much that I'm I'm opening it up for missed draws to make a play. Yep. That's the problem with, with yeah. checking the river for me is, um, <laughs> you know, I don't mind going check, check. And I'm actually surprised Jack 10 didn't just go check, check. Um, he yeah. must have been betting for value there. But, um, you know, I, if I bet the river, I mean, it's just such a weird spot. You know, that's why I hate being out of position so much. No, I uh, think I, I would have checked the river also. I would have been, I would have thrown up in my mouth a little bit when the button shoves. I think it's a check. That, oh, damn, did he have pocket eights and just hit his straight? Yeah. No, that that's the gross part. That seven is gross. Yeah. If he has eights, but it's hard to. I, I guess eights could be in his range, I suppose. Mm -hmm. Oh, definitely. Ace eight of hearts. Yeah, I just oh, yeah. I don't I don't like the eights there. If I'm if I have eights on the button, I don't like it at all with two other people because I'm drawn to the dummy end of it. I mean, well, a, a queen comes. Do I really love my my queen no, high straight there? But you love it when a seven comes. Yeah, I know, but I know exactly. <laughs> just magic card for it, I guess. Yeah, true. Yeah, but then you have four outs. You're yeah, just for the seven. Right. Yeah, that's right. it's a gross spot, John. I think it really is kind of a gross spot when you check. But I, I think I'm checking and calling, not just because of what happened here, but if he has King Queen and I, I think the only King Queen that he reasonably has here, I think, is the King Queen of Hearts. I just think if he has King Queen that are not two hearts, he should have he should have made a big play earlier to try to end this sucker. Yeah. To get the heart draws off. I don't know. It's, I it. it's gross. I got a question pre-flop. Why wouldn't you want to re-raise to something like when they raise you, you don't want the – a $650 bet is so small that when you call, it's like the dealer almost has to call with Jack Jim. Would you want to try to isolate, be in position, and only be heads up with pocket jacks? Or what – like if I had pocket eights there, I'd probably for sure call and try to set mine – at what point is it queens or do, do people not think jacks is good enough to be heads I think up? It's a weird, I think it's a weird spot because John did raise, you know, with his pocket jacks, the button calls, then the small blind re-raises, who's a pretty tight guy. So the, the danger, I mean, it's just tough because I, I like what you're saying, Doug. I like the idea of raising here again, even if just to isolate, like even just right. a, a min click to a thousand tough. just to, but the problem is that if this, if the small blind really has a big hand, his range is super tight. Well, then, then you fold then he's it. Gonna, if yeah. you run it to 1600 or something higher, then yeah. then the dealer can't call with something like like a Jack-10 offsuit or something. Right. You do isolate. I think the trade-up is you, you do isolate, and that's the positive. And uh, if the they neg shove, The negative then, is that you get, re re get ripped on. No, I know. And if they shove, I would probably be like, okay, I lost, you know, 15% of my stack. I'm going to wait and do a better right. spot. But Yeah. What oh, do yeah. other people think about that? Well, well I think just – Go ahead, John. Well, I was going back to, you know, if Steve, you, you mentioned that you don't like to play out of position. Well, here's a perfect example of how you can take control of that. And that's by yep. four betting the flop. And um, I would have been in that position, given those raises, you're either going to play it three handed in middle position, or you can four bet and either if they do have you beat, if they have kings or aces, they're going to raise you. But that's good information to get, and then you know you can uh, probably fold the hand without too much regret at that point in time. And, you know, you're losing a little bit of equity if you happen to hit your set, but that doesn't happen very often, although it did here. Um, so that's, that's my take on it. I think I would have started by seriously considering four betting the flop. Had the button bet bigger i might not because then there's a chance that the cutoff would have actually folded but with that price the cutoff can't right fold. that's that was my the point this it's only putting another 350 in for the dealer that's like to me that's nothing for the chance to win 
10,000. I mean, you got such good implied odds if you hit that I don't know why you'd even fold anything on the dealer. Yeah, once they call your 300, they should never fold to the to the raise to 650. Right. I mean, I think I've, I've got position on the person that three bit. Uh, yeah, I still got the button behind me, but I, I, it's a good, it's a really good point. I think for me, it's the trade off of trying to isolate, get heads up in position, which is a huge positive situation versus the risk of being four bet off by jacks, which kind of sucks. But what's the, what, like queens would you raise there if you had queens, Steve, in the, if you were John? Like what is, or like, to me, almost like jacks is kind of iffy. Queens, kings, or aces, I'd, I'd four bet for sure, I think. But tens, I'd probably be like, I'm going to try to set mine. So jacks is kind of like right on that border for me where I'd be like, well, maybe I want to set mine, but maybe I want to isolate too just to get heads up. And Yeah, I think for me, it becomes kind of player dependent. I think I think there's a, a number of situations if I'm going to flat with pocket jacks, I'll probably flat with pocket queens too. Hmm. Um, but what if it's a, if it's if it's a pretty aggressive uh, person that's three betting me out of the blinds, then I think both jacks and queens is a raise for me. And tens probably is too. And he said he said uh, the player was pretty tight. Right. I'm just, I'm just noticing that it's that three bets almost like a click back. Yeah. Yeah. It's only it is. It's a, yeah. It's a, it's a, like doubling. Yep. Right. So it's he's just like min raising there, and and that what does that tell us? It depends on the player, man. Sometimes that's just, uh, you know, sometimes that's aces. Yeah. But it's small know. enough that know. you could four bet and get away from it. Yeah, I think that's I think that's the guy's point, you know, about the 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 merits of four betting there is you can actually four bet fairly small here. Yep. To sixteen hundred or something and get a, get a ton of information. Like Correct. what you guys are not only do you probably get it in position because the button's going to fold. Uh, you get so much information, not only on their downside. I mean, you could get folds. You could just win it right there. Yep, um, yep. But you also, you understand if they're capped or not. If they don't five bet you, it's, I mean, it, probably not kings, but certainly not aces. Yep. The worst it could be at that point is probably queen. Yeah. Um, I, can I ask a question? Um was the, just you know for clarification this was this at final table no this is very early in the tournament we're okay. at 5100 yeah they're like 80 80 to 100 big lines deep um and how many how many uh where were you playing what what tournament was this was this it's down a home, eight? it's a home league it's a home league okay. yep. um and about how many players are you looking at uh that night we only had um 12. Okay. Because it was the final week of the season. All right. Because um, I've had some conversations with Heidi Ro Rogenkamp about this. Um, and she, she takes coaching from Fox pretty regularly. She works very closely with him. Um, and one of the things she imparted to me, and I, this, may, this may be more relevant to a larger field, um, but as a general rule, she said, particularly early in the tournament, um, you might want to consider playing tens and jacks as though they were smaller pairs. Um, now, in a 12-player tournament, maybe that's not so so much the case. You probably do want to be a little more aggressive with them. But you know, if you're in a larger larger field, um, I kind of like just flatting there and seeing where the flop comes. I think the thing that you have to do is watch the texture of the flop. And when you get something like that, yes, you've hit a set, but at the same time, you know, there's obvious, obvious straight draws out there. And I think you need to be aggressive right off the flop there and end the, end the hand as, as quickly as possible. If you're happy with what's in the pot and what you can take from that pot at that point, wouldn't it be better to try to just conclude the hand right there on the spot? Um, because even if he does have king, queen, and he calls a shove there or a large bet or he comes over the top of you and you're pretty much left with no option but to call him. Um, you know, you're looking at, you know, three, six outs for a boat. Um, if the turn doesn't, uh, doesn't pair the board, you've picked up another three outs for an, or an additional three outs for a boat, um, which, you know, not necessarily ideal, but, you know, if you're looking at 
the possibility of getting short here, um, you know, maybe the equity may be there at that point with that many chips in the pot. What are your thoughts? So I haven't really given my opinion yet, but I agree with a lot of what Nels was saying there. Um, I, I know everyone has kind of been talking about clicking it back at him, but I think this is a call pre-flop. When he raises to 650, it's a small re-raise. Um, I'm going to make a lot of assumptions about the big blind based off of what I've heard so far and kind of my own personal take on it. Um, if we know this player's tight, um, a lot of tight players don't three bet often. So we can really narrow down his three betting range, especially when we see the small sizing. Uh, typically it says, you know, they don't really know what their sizing should be on three bets because they don't do it frequently enough. Um, so I think we're against ace, queen, ace, king, aces, kings, queens, jacks, and maybe tens, but I discount tens quite a bit because I think that's probably the very edge of his range. Uh, to which case, I think we are behind and we probably shouldn't be throwing in money when we're, when we're pretty sure that we're behind. Uh, likewise, with such a tight range, we're going to be able to outplay him post-flop quite a bit especially since we have position on him. Um, we're kind of turning jacks into a set mining hand, so we don't mind if the button calls. Um, plus, we do still have some playability if it does come you know, lower than a 10 on the flop. We have the overpair. Um, we have a lot of equity that's somewhat disguised because we did just call pre-flop. Um, so uh, to, I think it was Doug's point before, like where is the edge in terms of where we're for betting and where we're just calling. And I think this is it with Jacks. I think Queens um, were ahead of his range just slightly, uh, but with Jacks we are behind and uh, would probably play better as a call and just kind of like see the rest of the hand in position, especially since we're so deep. Uh, like Nels was kind of saying, like we're so deep in this, like Jacks really, don't have the same value as when you're later in a tournament and everyone's short stacked. When everyone's playing with 100 big blinds, um, jacks kind of lose a lot because you can lose a big pot uh, pretty easily. I'm off my grandstand. No, that was good, dude. <laughs> good stuff. Other thoughts on that? Okay. All right. Well, either pre-flop or flop, turn, river, any other thoughts? I appreciate you bringing this hand, John. Yeah, thank you all. So you ended up busting the tournament, huh? No luck? Yeah, I, I actually got knocked out first in the tournament. Oh. Wait, can I ask one more question? Okay. You said nope. you were playing 12-handed. Uh, are you playing six people at two tables? Yes. Ooh, okay. This does kind of change it then. Playing six-handed, um, it get, can get a little bit dicier, but since, well, since I, the label this guy is tight, I, I think all of what I said still stands. I think the question would be, you know, is this, you know, your, your opponent that you're playing, I think just a min-raise a min raise does kind of tell you, like Taylor said, a little bit about their experience level. Usually uh, players are going to, you know, size up a little bit there. But, you know, is this the kind of player that, would play differently six-handed than they would nine or ten-handed. The big blind? No, yeah. he would play this. He would play the same way whether it was a full table or or six players or four players. Um, he doesn't change very often. I, I will say that all of these players in this league have been playing for fifteen plus years, um, and a lot of them playing together for that long. Yeah. So uh, they know each other very very well. Okay. So Taylor, I don't know if that changes your thoughts at all. You know, normally if you're playing a you know nine or ten handed table versus six handed table, you know there's there's range adjustments all over the place. Uh, if he's the kind of player that's playing the same way, does that change your thoughts on that at all? Uh, it reinforces what I'm saying. If he yeah. if he's the type of guy that's only looking at his hand value and then deciding what to do from there, I think um, everything I was saying stays the same. Uh, where I kind of hesitated was um, a more experienced player will uh, be three betting a lot more in a six handed game, just because right. you're going to be interacting with the same people more frequently. And therefore you're kind of like developing this history. 
Um, in this situation, though, it just seems like the guy's a little bit less experienced. Like a raise to 300 with a call behind, like the three bet size there should be somewhere around 1200, but he makes it 650. Like one, you're not getting anyone to fold. Two, it's a type of bet that a very premium hand does make. Just kind of like, hey, let's let's throw some more in the pot. I know you're not going to fold, but I'm ahead of you, type of stuff. Right. At least from like a inexperienced player or someone who plays less often. Yep. Okay. Any other thoughts on that particular hand? All right. Uh, thank you again, John Vensky. Appreciate that. All right. Well, we're, we're wide open here, guys. What, what do we want to talk about? What's burning on your mind? We got another 45 minutes or so. This is just kind of open forum discussion. Uh, anybody have uh, either a hand they've been wrestling with or a subject that they want to chat through with this crew? Hey, I'll throw something out there. I'm getting ready to play for a double bag or triple bag. Um, maybe throw out some strategy on that. I either interrupted you or I kind of missed the first part of that, Don. Can you say that again? I'm getting ready to play in a tournament where you double bag or triple bag, and you just uh, you just did that. I was wondering if there was any strategy you could uh, talk oh. about. So are you mean like there's there's buybacks? Yes. Okay, yeah. So for, for those of you guys who aren't familiar with that, so running Ace is just at a buyback tournament where – uh, and, and Don, correct me if this isn't how the structure is working for the one that you're playing. Uh, but you, you get through, you play day one, there's multiple flights for day one. And if you get through, then that's your bag. That's what you'll play on day two. Um, but if you get through more than one time, uh, you actually play your biggest bag and then your smallest bag has some value. Uh, the tournament I was playing was a $290 buy-in. Uh, if you if you get multiple bags through, then the smaller bag is worth twelve hundred dollars. So you play the big stack, and then you get paid twelve hundred dollars on the small stack. So that's consistent, Don, with what you're talking about. Yes. Yeah. So it, it's super dynamic. I, I think you know I've thought about this quite a bit, and so I think there is kind of a strategic advantage just from having thought through it. It plays kind of both like a tournament and a qualifier. It's a kind of this weird dynamic. It's it's not exactly a qualifier because you don't play down to a certain number of people. It's a timed thing. So the way that the way that I do it anyway is I have I've actually worked through the math and I have I've looked at the, the blind structure and I have a pre-specified amount that's my target amount to have um, uh, available to make sure that I can fold all the way to a bag. Now, if you're playing just one flight, obviously you just want to kind of get a big bag and go for it. But if you're playing with the idea of I'm going to play multiple flights and I just want to at least get one bag before I go for the second bag, that's where this comes in. So um, I don't want to give away all my secrets, but but anyway, I've, I've worked through the math and I have, and Don, I can give you this offline if you want for our structure. But, um, you know, I say, okay, the running ace and stuff is 16 levels long uh, for day one. And so I know at the when I start level 13, I want to have this many in chips. If I have this many in chips, I feel like I can fold all the way through, assuming uh, like two orbits a level um, and paying all the blinds and antis, and I'll still be okay, and I'll still have at least – I always leave a buffer, uh, but I'll at least have, you know, 10,000 chips available or something like that uh, to get through. So I have this number in mind, and if I'm – obviously, if I'm below that, then I know I have work to do. I'm going to have to keep playing pots and trying to generate and win chips to get to that point. Uh, but if I'm lucky enough to have more chips than kind of that buffer amount, the way that I approach it is I, I look at that difference and say, those are the chips that I have to put to work. So let's say, say for example, at some point I say, I need 40,000 chips at this point. And if I have 70,000 chips and my primary objective is just to get a bag, uh, like this was my case in the tournament, uh, I had already bagged like 120,000 chips. So I either wanted to get a bigger bag, like 200,000, or I just wanted to end with, you know, just a pittance. Uh, just enough to earn $1,200. So what I wanted to do is say, well, let's, let's save the 40 that I need and then let's put that 30,000 to work. So I'm, I'm still somewhat careful, but I'm looking for spots. Uh, I'm looking for spots like three bet an aggressive player. I'm looking for spots to kind of enter a pot with a nut flush draw, some kind of thing like that. Um, looking to put that, that amount to work. And so let's say, um, 
you know, if I lose a pot, obviously my, my buffer is shrinking. That's a problem. But if I win a pot, all of a sudden now I have a bigger buffer. So now instead of 30,000, I maybe have 60,000 that I now have available to kind of put to work. And so now I'm looking for big spots. Like uh, maybe there's an all in shove for 30,000 and I have an opportunity to close the action where I maybe would never call with queen jack, but I might do that in that situation because I'm gambling because those are my kind of my play chips uh, to try to go big or go home. So I guess that's, that's how I view it in kind of a high level strategy is here's how much I need to make sure I don't screw up and lose, which I almost did the other day. Um, and then here's the, here's the amount that I can kind of play with to try to go after a big bag. So any thoughts on that, Don, does that kind of resonate or does that kind of answer your question or not really? Did I just freeze? <laughs> no, you're, you're okay. Good. I've had that happen before. I might have frozen. Uh, <laughs> okay. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Your microphone wasn't on. My my microphone microphone wasn't on. No, Don, did that help at all, or is that not what yeah. you're looking for? But we play down to ten percent. The tournament we ten percent. So you play all the way down to the cash then? Yes. Okay, so so day two it starts as a cash. So that that's more like a traditional qualifier then, right? So you're not playing it. It's not a timed amount at all. It's just once you hit 10%, it just ends. Yes. Oh, interesting. Okay. So that plays more like your traditional qualifier then uh, once you have a bag, but I guess you still have that sort of, you're trying to get a big bag yet you want to keep some bag. So you can't quite use the same methodology I use because I've got kind of this buffer built in because I know it's a timed thing. Like I know they're going to play through the middle of level 16 and then they're going to draw a card for between two and six hands. So I can really, uh, plan out how many chips I need to save. Uh, that's a different than, you know, more of a traditional qualifier where there's no time limit. It's just until everybody busts. So that's a little bit trickier there, I think. Uh, but um, then I, then I suppose I, I'd probably go back to more of my, I have a qualifier strategy too, where I have sort of a, here's, here's an amount that I, I want to get you to feel comfortable with uh, in a, in a standard qualifier. Uh, so I still kind of have a buffer there, but it's a little bit trickier to navigate as you start getting short there. Okay. Right, anybody else have any other thoughts to help Don? So it's a, basically it's a qualifier plus. It's a 10% qualifier, but uh, I also still want to build a stack. It's kind of this tension between preserving and going after a stack. Well, one thing you have to do in a satellite, you have to pay attention to what's going on on the other tables. So when you're getting close to, to that bubble factor, you might get into situations where you have a premium hand, but you're you're not necessarily willing to play that because there's two or three other people that have stacks shorter than yours that are going to have to get all in before you do. So if you're playing it like a satellite, that's the main thing is to really pay attention to where you are in a tournament and how many people are left to bust and where your chip stack is in relation to the shorter ones. Right. Got it. Yeah, I'd say, yeah, I agree. And part of the overall strategy is just how many, how many flights are you going to fire? Is this your first one or your last attempt? <clears throat> you know, how comfortable are you that you can bag if you just get something through? Um, I think those are kind of your overall things. Cause some people would say, well, I'm not going to play it like a satellite. I'm going to either get a big bag or, or nothing, but you also have this weird dynamic that not weird, but a different dynamic than I had that at the end of day one, you're in the money too. So it's, it's not just, the day two bubble, right. it's not just your buyback bubble, it's actually your money bubble. So you've got a big bubble <laughs> going on there. Well, if you, if you know you're going to play more than one flight, then, then you need to play each flight like a satellite. But if you're only going to play the second flight, if you cash the first flight, then that, that's a different, little different dynamic. But if you go in knowing you're going to play, you're going to fire two or three bullets, uh, two or three different flights, then each flight then becomes um, a war of attrition. You just want to get there thinking that one of those flights, you're going to be able to take a bigger stack out, right? Yeah, to find a spot to chip up. Because right. I've done that before where I've kind of gone into, I've had a, a you know, uh, an okay bag, and then I'm going to go into the next one saying, I'm going to get a big bag, or I'm going to get nothing, or, you know, just try to get a little bit. And it looks like, okay, this is just going to be a grind to try to get there. And all of a sudden a spot opens up and you're like, you know what? I, I could get busted here, but this is such a good spot. You know, I flop a set four-handed against a flush draw. Um, you know, I could just fold and try to get the money or this could be an opportunity. So, you know, you, 
you know, you remain a little bit flexible where you can shift gears and say, well, this is too good of a spot to actually go after a big bag and make a deep run. Um, but I think it's good just kind of know what your intention is overall. Um, yeah. Steve, can you talk a little bit about some of the conversations we've had at um, when you get down close to that bubble and how you've taken advantage of that in, in some of these qualifiers or in other tournaments too, where depending on your table, you can really add to your, add to your bag just being aggressive there? Or not yeah. necessarily aggressive, but t talk a little bit about some of the things we've, we've talked about. Yeah, for sure. I think in a, in a situation like the one that we just played at Running Aces where, um, you know, you're trying to get a bag. I, I think I did the same thing at, in, and had two different results depending on the table. So the first, the first bag that I had, uh, I think I had 30,000 chips uh, entering the final level. And uh, I think I needed to have 22,000 or something was sort of my number, my buffer number, that I could survive two orbits because it was like 10,000 in an orbit in this big blind anti thing. So I knew I, I'd be fine getting through two orbits. So I had like 22,000 I wanted to have. So I had 8,000 uh, chips kind of as my, my play money, uh, which was two big blinds. And I thought, well, let's see what happens here. Uh, folded around to me on the button. I had like, you know, seven deuce. It doesn't, doesn't matter what I had. Uh, I raised 8,000 and they both folded. All right. Okay, cool. Now I've got 18,000 of sort of play money. Uh, it folded around to me again. Um, I was in a cutoff. I raised to 18,000. They, they all folded. Oh, I got 28,000. So I was able to, to do that and, you know, not be stupid with every hand, but kind of pick my spots. And before you knew it, you know, the last 20 minutes of the tournament, I went from 30,000 to 119,000. I actually had a reasonable bag that I could play on day two. Um, I was kind of in the situation the next day uh, and tried the same sort of thing. Um, and I immediately got re-raised and the guy just looked at me like, I know what you're trying to do. Uh, so, you know, there went my buffer, there went my opportunity of chipping up and then I just shut her down and, and folded into the money. So um, I think that is... I think the strategic advantage is just really understanding that dynamic for me of the buffer and the play chips, and then just seeing what the table lets you do and not, not being afraid to take a shot at it. Um, maybe that's what you're referring to, Stacey, but that, that's kind of the strategic advantage in a, in a pure satellite where you don't have the, you don't really have that upside potential that you're worried about at all, because it just doesn't matter if you have a lot of chips, then it's a much more, I think, straightforward, um, just try to survive. Uh, but the, these examples are just as weird. It's just such a weird, interesting di dynamic of my, my number one goal is to survive, yet my number one goal is to chip up. I have two number one goals um, and trying to figure out how to navigate those waters. But yeah, I think, I think the, uh, the final table or the, uh, the end of day one bubble, I think is a super interesting thing. Because even if it's not a money bubble, Don D, you're saying in, in your case, it's a money bubble. In a lot of these running aces ones or the, the local ones here in Minnesota, it's not the money bubble. They advance 15% or so, and it's still plenty of work to do to get to the top 10%. Uh, you really just, you, you chat with people at your table, you find out what they want to do. Uh, people will tell you, um, man, I've never bagged for day two. I'm just so excited to get a bag. Okay, I'm never folding to you. I'm going to keep <laughs> raising you. Not to be me, but that's what they, they tell you. Or you just know some players, they couldn't care less about bagging or not. They're going to try to build a big stack. So you know that you can't really pick on them at all. Um, so I think I think that end of day is it's a it's an artificial bubble. It really doesn't mean anything at all. Uh, it's right. not a money bubble. You know, if it's a buyback, yeah, it means something. But a lot of times, day two tournaments don't have that situation. But there's just some sort of a psychological uh, element where people just want to bag. I'll admit I like to bag too. But man, it's such a good opportunity. I know uh, I went from eighty thousand to two hundred sixty thousand at a tournament just by raising every hand the last level. Because uh, everybody just wanted to bag. And I'm like, that's great. You guys all just bag. This is fantastic for you. Meanwhile, I'll take 10,000 chips every every orbit. So I think it's really good to kind of test the waters and see where the table's at. Uh, and it's just such a great opportunity to chip up. So who was it that said, I know what you're doing? Uh, <laughs> uh, who, I don't even know who it was. Um, but it was somebody I chatted with uh, who was, yeah, I don't remember who it was. Uh, it wasn't <laughs> a guy I play with all the time. But I've had that before, too. <laughs> uh, but, but, you know, being aware of that sort of example, uh, uh, you know, I played with Aaron Johnson one time and him and I were both just, you know, trying to cockroach into the day two. And so we were both just, just tanking the whole time, but there's a, it's, it's, a, here's another good spot to chip up. Like I mentioned, um, oh, I don't know, a few, a few years ago, I was playing at one of these tournaments and a guy on my right, a young guy was just saying, oh, I just, I've already got a bag. I've got like 300 K. I just want to get the buyback. Thank you for telling me. Um, yep. Uh, well, and somebody said that at my table said, hey, don't you already have two bags? I'm like, don't say that. Shh. But anyway, this guy on my right said, 
you know, I've already got, you know, we're just chatting, being friendly. And he's like, I just got to get through. Well, he had like 70,000 chips. Uh, and we were on the, literally the last hand of this tournament. And I had like 250,000. I had a nice, nice big stack or whatever. So he raises to 60,000 out of his 70,000 chip stack. Wow. And I, I just shipped on him and he folded. Because I knew he was going to. He's just screwing around. Because he, he's never going to risk his last 10,000 chips. <laughs> so I picked up 60,000 just being aware of the situation and what's going on. Because yeah. it looks like he's super strong. He's not. He's just screwing around. He's raised a 60K out of a 70K and then folded to a re-raise. And you know, I showed him like 8-4 or something. I had nothing. But I just knew he was going to fold. Didn't matter. That sounds like collusion to me. Steve. It did. I know. People are like, Look, what are you guys doing? And I'm like, no. <laughs> He just he just donated sixty thousand chips and I got to bring in today too. So uh, sorry, Donna, we're maybe getting off or whatever. Or Stacy, I don't know if that answers your question, but yeah, those are some of those strategic things that I think uh, I think there's such a great advantage to think through prior to, but also the way that these are happening. I mean, this is two thirty in the morning, so people are tired. They've already like emotionally, psychologically checked out. Uh, it's such a good opportunity to to kind of take advantage of that situation. Yeah, so, yeah the, go ahead. Stace, did you have something there? Yeah, I thought somebody else was going to j- jump in. I've just, after a couple of those conversations, it's, I mean, that's somewhat true even at a final table or the regular bubble or that type of thing. And what I noticed in our conversation was you weren't, you weren't going hog wild and going all in on every hand until somebody eventually comes up with a hand and then calls you it's you're kind of min raising especially at the end of the tournaments when the big stack only has 22 big blinds and everybody else is sitting there with you know eight to 14 and you're just min raising and people are folding and they're smiling at you kind of going i know what you're doing dork but <laughs> nobody dares step in because they don't want to their only move is to shove over top and yep. they're not ready to do that just in case you do have a hand and and yeah really so it's not just those you know there's a lot of bubbles and artificial bubbles that you've kind of mentioned over the time yeah no you're you're absolutely right i think um even today george and i were a final at a final table today today together which is super fun uh yay um (laughs) by the way yeah by the way george i i I pocket queens and i flopped top set with queens and lost on a flush draw that's how i busted um that might make you feel better um (laughs) it was a it was super exciting um But, but no, even there, I think just watching people's reaction. Well, you know, you know who's been there a lot. And you watch people, and they're, looking up at the, they're looking up at the board all the time. Every time somebody busts, they're looking at the board. And a lot of times, they're looking at the pay jump. What's the next pay jump? What's the next pay jump? And those are clues that this, these people just want to ladder up. Now, obviously, they'll play huge hands. Uh, but I think those are the kind of things that you're looking for. The guys that are saying, hey, guys, want to chop? You want to chop? Um, you know, just that sort of thing are, is usually a sign that they're not that confident, and they just want to ladder up. And they're only going to play premium hands. So yeah, those are, I think those are great opportunities to, to, to win a lot of chips. And like you said, min raises often will just do it. You kind of find out what the table will dictate. When you win so much at that point with all the antis, oh, a, a min raise, you know, if you're fairly short stacked and you, you can min raise and go half your stack knowing you'll fold if somebody comes over the top, but you just almost double up. Yeah, you, no, it's, it's huge. Buying the, buying the pot. Buying the pot. Yeah, the blinds are two four and the antis are five hundred. Say eight person table. There's ten thousand in the middle. Yeah. You raised eight thousand. You pick up ten thousand. Yeah. Uh, yeah, you risked eight, but you know that works a couple of times, especially at running aces where it's pretty shallow. By the time you get to the final table, I mean nobody's got like everybody's got like eight to ten big blinds. Yeah. So you pick up twenty thousand chips. That's huge, uh, and now it makes it makes it more uh, unlikely for people to play back at you. Right. You know, there, I'm, there's a lot of really good players on this call. I mean, who else has who has some good thoughts on this as far as playing bubbles, whether real or artificial, or final table or laddering up? Well, I think uh, in the qualifier only type situation, I've seen a lot of times where if you haven't went and checked the other tables, if there's multiple tables in the qualifier, not realizing the short stacks that are available to go out ahead of you. I've qualified three times for the next hand, I would be the big blind and I didn't have enough chips to cover the big blind. Wow. I looked at the other tables and there was a guy ahead of me that had less chips than me that had to play. Yeah. They went out and the next hand I had half a big blind and I would have been in the big blind 
but I didn't have to play. And I qualified and picked up, you know, $1,100 certificate. Yeah. So it's real important to make sure you're checking the whole situation when you're in those qualifiers. That's a really, really good point. Yeah. And conversely, if you have a big stack, what are you, what are you doing? Um, I had this guy that had like, I mean, the average stack when you qualify at running aces, at least one out of what, one out of five is a 50,000 stack. And he had like 90,000. I mean, he could have just walked away and all of a sudden he just starts, he's going to win this qualifier, man. He would, he ended up getting down to like 11,000 chips, you know, and he was at, he was at risk at one point he did get through, but I'm like, wow. I mean, just being aware of the whole situation, what are you actually trying to do? It's like, it's like advice for life. Like, what are you ultimately trying to do in this situation? And with a qualifier, your number one goal should be, I'm trying to be in the top 20% or 10%, depending on the qualifier you're playing. That's your goal. Your goal is not to accumulate, you know, beyond that, your goal is not to prove your manhood by three betting or whatever it is, um, you know, or to, or to push back at somebody who's pushing you, your goal is to qualify. So I think that's just a critical thing to keep in mind at all times. So whether it's like you said, George, if you're short stacked, look around, see who's out there. Don't make the mistake of, of, of giving away all of your chips when somebody else is going to bust in the next hand. And if you're big stacked, don't waste your chips. I don't care if you have aces or kings. It's just you, you, you earn, you, there's no more value for having 300,000 at the end of the qualifier than there is at having 30,000. Yeah, I had the same opposite circumstance in another tournament where I was the big stack at the table and I got pocket queens and I got the two blinds left. So I shove. The big blind calls me. He's the second biggest stack. Oh, and George. <laughs> we had 200 chips less he had than I had. He had ace king student. He calls me. He could have danced into the qualifier. I mean, there's no way. He could have left and, and just right. folded his way in, never had to worry about it. We only had two people left to knock out. We're the two big stacks. And I, he doesn't hit his ace or a king, and he's out of the turn out of the qualifier. But if he does, then you're basically out, right? Right. But I had already made the move. <laughs> right, right. He doesn't have a pair. Yeah, I don't know. What, what are you doing shoving awesome. there, George? What are you, doing? Yeah, you don't shove there, George. Are you shoving? Don't shove. God, is that what they teach you in Princeton? Well, we don't know much, but uh, <laughs> after I had, it didn't make sense for him to make the calls. What no, I, I totally agree with you. I 100% agree with you. Once you shove there, he should be folding aces, honestly. Yes. Yeah. yeah but you shouldn't have shoved there either, George. <laughs> well, you know, I am Come from... Come on, I'm in raise, and then you get I'm away from, from it. <laughs> No, but you're, you're right. I mean, you, you see it quite often. And that's always kind of my hope when I'm in qualifiers is that even when I'm short, I'm not just looking at the short stacks. I'm looking at who's at the table because there's players. And I know several of them at running aces that just, they won't slow down. Um, so even if I have three big blinds, uh, there's actually a chance that one of the big stacks might bust just because they get into a war with each other. I'm just hoping somebody raises, somebody calls and the flop is like queen jacked in. You know, because I just know nobody's ever going to fold. All right, any other any other thoughts, guys, or anything else we want to wrestle with tonight? Well, speaking of qualifiers, I was listening to the Chip Race podcast today, and Darrow Kearney, you know, he wrote the book uh, "Saddle Base uh, Poker Satellite Strategy," just came out, or actually hasn't even come out yet. Hmm. Okay. Um, but anyway, they were talking. They were talking about a situation. Here's a guy that had, he had three big blinds, and he was he was on the. I think he just passed the blind, so he had a he had four or five hands now until he was going to hit the blinds again. He had like three big blinds. He went and looked at all the other tables, and saw another guy that was about to hit the blinds with a shorter stack than he did. He looks down, he has pocket kings. Ready or not, I come. He open folded. Yes. Yeah. Open folded the pocket kings just because, you know, he saw that there was another guy out there. And that's what George was saying. Go around and make sure you know what's going on on the other tables. You might not be the shortest stack, and there might be a number of players that are ready to bust before you do. Yep. Yeah, no, that's super good. So how did you, did you get like a preview of this book somehow? No, no, I was listening to a podcast. Oh, okay. Okay. Got gotcha. Chip Race podcast with Daryl Kearney. It's there's yeah. a couple guys out of Scotland or Ireland yeah. or someplace. Ireland. Okay. okay. It's a podcast. You can get it 
right next to where you get the rec poker podcast. Oh, is that right? I don't even I don't know anything about podcasts. So I don't no, that's pod ultra. You're talking to the yeah. rec poker podcast. You can't what are you doing, Rob? Listening to other the... podcasts? Yeah, I I know I cheated. What can I say? Post post flop podcast. I listen to the post flop podcast. That's a great podcast. Thinking there's, poker. There's yeah, all kinds there's of a lot of really good ones. Yeah, for sure. Yep. You know, you've got a good one, Steve, but I have to admit there are others that are oh my almost gosh. as good. <laughs> oh, no, I, <laughs> oh my, I hope so. I hope they're far better than, than, than we have. I think, you know, we have a different sort of niche that we fill, but man, there's a lot of good stuff. And those, uh, the, the folks that I've met that are running the other podcasts are just, they're fantastic, yeah. uh, fantastic people. And they, they care a ton about the, the poker community too. So a lot of good stuff. As long as you bring back your wisdom and share it with the uh, rec poker nation. <laughs> Yeah, guys, I got that book. Oh, oh you do? You? Yeah, that book's out. All right, cool. Oh, right oh, there. Oh, there, there it is. It's proof. Yeah. Say, cool. say something. Say something as you hold the book up because that, that up triggers the, the camera. Okay, can you see it? Nope. Not now. You blacked out. There you go. Now I'll say something. Okay. There. Man, that dude looks lit. <laughs> so, that's, so it is out now. Darryl Kearney. <laughs> All right. How? What? Have you read it yet, or just get it? I read it. It's good. Which, okay. It's good. It might be something that, like a book, we got we can discuss. Yeah. No, we we've done that in the past, and I actually really enjoyed doing some kind of a book study. What was there anything any big uh, insights that you can remember that about playing satellites? He was talking sort of what you said. He tries to get to a, uh, a certain level, like, um, I don't know the formula right off, like 10 times the starting stack, and then 70% uh, of that. Like, you don't want to just get to the average. You want to get to, like, 70% of your target stack yep. because, you know, the bigger the tournaments are because there'll be more people with short stacks and big stacks, so you don't need to get exactly to your target stack. And then he was talking about, fold, you know, folding and stuff like that. Well, that's interesting. Yeah, that, that's actually the number that I, I kind of use. So I typically use, he might be talking about a 10% a, a satellite. So we're, the ones that I play are typically 20% satellites. So with the 10K starting stack, the average stack uh, when you get to the money is 50,000. And I use 35,000 as my target. So I always feel like if I can get to 35,000, um, then I feel pretty good. Obviously, you can still make it through with less. But once I get to 35,000, I feel like I don't really need to worry about accumulating. I might still take a great spot if it's there, but I feel like I can pretty much uh, shut her down once I get to that 70% of what the average stack would be when we hit the money. Yeah, he talks about chance of cashing and chance of bubbling. Hmm, okay. Is it is it a heavily math-based book? No, no. Okay. I mean, Dang there are, are some charts. There are some charts, you know, GTO and then ICM, and then taking that in consideration. But then he also talks about playing against nits or maniacs. You have to take that in consideration because everybody's not going to do what they're supposed to do. Like, you know, you shove right. cards and they're supposed to fold. Like he said, he, he, shoved with, or he shoved with queens and that person's supposed to fold everything. But he called with ace king. Yeah. A lot of people don't know they're supposed to fold. Right. Yeah, you kind of want to figure out who knows what they're supposed to do. Right. Don, do you play a lot of qualifiers? I play a little bit, not as much. I mean, every once in a while. Okay. It's one of those things that I've encouraged a lot of. Um, I mean, I liked it too, but a lot of, you know, starting players when they're making the transition to the casino and that sort of thing. Uh, I think qualifiers are just a, a phenomenal value. Uh, the ones that I play, uh, you get the top 20%, you get 4X on your money. And for folks that aren't super comfortable, you know, going deep and running deep, they have the kind of, they have the kind of game where they can survive a long time because they play pretty tight, but they're not really comfortable taking those big spots and mixing it up. I think they have the kind of game and I would encourage people that are maybe listening, just, um, you know, if, you, if that sort of describes you like, man, I can, I can survive a long time, but I end up busting always sort of in that top, I get to the top 15 or top 20% and then I always bust. Qualifiers are a great option because that's what you need to do. And then you get 4X your money. And a lot of times in the tournaments that we play, you have to get like the top five spots to get 4X on your money. Now, you can't get 20X your money, but I think there's a great potential value there um, 
you know, chance to build a bake roll, just, just playing qualifiers. And I right. played, I play a ton of qualifiers whenever they're around, whenever I can play. Uh, and I probably rarely play the main events. I mean, uh, you can usually just take the cash or take the lammers or sell the certificate or something. So I just think that's a great, a great value option for a lot of people. I agree. All right. Anything, anything else out there, gentlemen? All these sage faces I see. Steve, when you played qual, so when I was only playing qualifiers, I was playing like really passive. And then if I ever played a tournament, I would be like overwhelmed. Like there's no way, you know, you talk yourself into there's no way I can win this. Hmm. And until I started playing tournaments thinking, you know, I can accumulate chips and make the money and stuff. I, I, I mean, it's a good place to start. Like if you've never played in a casino, I'd recommend you start there because you're going to be overwhelmed otherwise. But I found like just doing qualifiers mostly, I wouldn't ever even come close to cash. And then in a real tournament, even in a home game, I'd be sitting back just getting into that passive. I know I can survive this. I know I can make the final table and I know I'm going to go in with five big blinds and get my money back, but that's it. And so. so. So are you saying kind of just, just playing qualifiers? I think, yeah, I, I would say if you just think, well, I'm going to, I mean, if you're just going to go play qualifiers, I just never got better at, and I would never, right. think that. I would never think of pre betting when I was in a qualifier. I would just be like, no, I'm just going to call here and keep accumulating a little bit of chips and make the money. And that's, that's all I wanted to do is, you know, just qualify. But yeah, I think, I think there's a couple of thoughts on that. I think one is, um, you know, if, if you're sort of afraid to play aggressively, I think, uh, there's a good chance a lot of the people you're playing against are play, afraid to play aggressively. So it's actually a, a, a good opportunity to kind of practice three betting because you might get more folds than you would in a regular tournament. Yeah. So there is, it, there's kind of an opportunity to work on some things there. Um, yeah, and I, I think you're right. I think you have to adjust your style a little bit. But, but frankly, I think I play the same way to start a qualifier as I do to start a tournament. I'm trying to, you know, I'm trying to uh, preserve and then build, you know, when we kind of get into that stage. I think for me, the only difference is, once I get to that 35,000, then I sort of shut her down. Uh, but I don't really play any different. But I think some people do. They just kind of go in super, I'm just going to survive. I'm just going to survive. And they don't realize how long a qualifier actually lasts if you're never playing a hand. <laughs> you, yeah. you will blind out. But I, I think you raise a good point. I think it's, I'm thinking more like, you know, as I talk to people, and this is where I am, I was such a big proponent of tracking your results. Um, and just very, very few people do, which is fine. Um, but I always ask people like, you know, kind of where do you finish when you keep busting out? And I just get, I get a ton of min caches or I get to the bubble and I'm just always short. I think those are the folks where I'm, I wouldn't necessarily say change your approach, but I'd say just try some qualifiers and play the same way because uh, you'll probably help your bankroll a little bit there. Mm -hmm. And until you start getting comfortable, you know, playing for that top three. Yeah. But it's a good point though. You can get, you can kind of get sucked into a, a state of just playing super passive because you're just trying to survive to the top 20%. Uh, which is great for qualifiers and really, really bad for tournaments. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, that is it for this episode. Thanks again for joining us. Uh, hopefully that gave you a flavor for what we're doing on Monday nights, how we're trying to grow our game together and in the context of community. Uh, so you are welcome to join us uh, any Monday night that works out for you. You don't have to make it for each one. You don't have to even make it for all of it. Just kind of tune in when you can. Uh, so register for that at recpokertraining.com or reach out to me, Steve, at recpokertraining.com uh, if you have any questions, comments, concerns, whatever that might be. All right. Again, once again, thanks to Running Aces for being our official sponsor. And uh, until we chat again, good luck on and off the felt.